everyone, my name is Rebecca. I'm a fish biologist, a lake theologist, and also a PhD student. I specialise and study the evolution of loyal cards, catfishes, who are also known as plecos or L numbers within the aquarium trade, and sometimes stuff like whiptail catfishes. So I've always seen quite a lot of myths when it comes to talk about plecos and introducing them to people. And while some of them are kind of not too bad, as in they won't harm the fish, some of them kind of give to the totally wrong idea about this group of fishes. Um, anything from diet advice, so poor diet advice that's uh, either never been true or has been proven wrong. Um, to all sorts. So today I'm just going to do a video introducing this group of fishes, um, mostly to someone that might not be too familiar with them or might not know some of the basics about plecos or loyal carids. So some things are somewhat controversial even though they shouldn't be because we do have some reasonable studies on these fishes. So, plecos, Lorcardae. Lorcardae is a family of fishes, so that is, well, as I suggested, plecos. And it is within the order Siluriform. So, plecos are catfishes. This is a big uh, misconception. A lot of people ha don't believe they're catfishes at all. They just don't have that um, sort of traditional Siluriform catfish look that you think of with the uh, Native American um, catfishes or Slurus glanis, the European uh, or Eastern European catfish and anything like Clarius and stuff like that. So it's a very large group of fishes, Lorcarda. It comprises of 1,050 species last time I looked and that's only described species. There's many more undescribed species and that's why you might see something called the L number system or numbers uh, regarding different Lorcarids and hence why the name L numbers comes along. This is, um, I'm only going to briefly touch on it, but this is just a way of classifying those that are variants or undescribed species. There's plenty of faults and errors with it. Uh, for example, L200 can, um, includes two species that are closely related, but they're not sister species. You can't say they're the same species at all. Um, and then many species might have multiple L numbers and there's a few sort of misconceptions about certain L numbers um, uh, some species get given, um, get called an L number that they're not there is a sort of uh, a record of what is what L number but it's not a sort of a scientific thing so it's a little bit more flexible but that's why you might see these numbers mentioned um, they're somewhat useful and somewhat not. Scientific names are always more valid um, or useful in a way. But you have to remember that it's not always about undescribed species. Tyrioplicthes gibbyceps, so that's the gibbyceps pleco, the self in pleco, uh, the common pleco. That has had an L number for years, but it was described probably 100 years before it was given that L number. And it's not the only one with that sort of situation. So there's a lot of fishes that you might see called plecos um, and this, these might be hill stream loaches um, particularly um, different pleco um, different loaches get confused but they are vastly different. Firstly when you look at um, a pleco they're defined by having a ventrally facing mouth with some sort of suction disc not all can suck some um, are just meant to going through the uh, substrate. So not all are sucker mouths. And then the big one is that loyal cards, plecos don't have scales. They have what's known as dermal plating. And this is where it's kind of quite obvious the difference between them, other catfishes um, or other sort of, um, sort of uh, ventrally facing all mouth catfishes, so it's just kind of glan, stuff you don't really see anyway, um, some scissoridae and stuff like that. But also what differs them from that, um, hill stream loaches and other sort of um, sucker um, loaches is that these loaches, loaches have scales, law cards have dermal plating, quite thick dermal plating, that's why they're quite solid fishes. Um, and it's sort of, 
similar somewhat I believe to bone but I don't think there's any too much studies on composition um, it's more similar compositional I think to arapaima or sturgeon which is why sort of scales is a weird term that some for certain fishes even though like they don't really actually have scales so yes, they don't, uh, Lord Card said that dermal plating, that venture facing or disc, um, so it's not really always a sucker mouth. It, they do have barbels, like all catfishes. They just tend to be very short, apart from some of them, they might have um, other extensions around that mouth. So one of the big things that you'll see if you're new to the hobby, people will say that plecos get big, too big. And this is a myth probably started from some Tyrophyctes, some common plecos do get particularly large, but not all loyal cards are large. So there's a wide size range. Anything uh, from one centimetre, one point eight centimetre standard length, which is less than an inch, about what half an inch all the way to a metre standard length. And those large ones aren't actually common pleco. Stuff like Acanthicus um, adenis, which is the adenis pleco, um, has bright white spots, a black body, but grows monstrous. Panax, so Panax shafari, um, grows to 60 centimetres, so that's one of the royal plecos. Um, Acanthicus grows big, one of them does grow over 60 centimetres. Hypostomus has many larger members. But then there's so many smaller ones and that's got to be emphasised. The main thing with this group is research because there's so many myths about what fish gets to what size. And remember that reliable websites like Planet Catfish, Scott Cat use standard length. So whenever they're talking about the length of the fish, they're excluding the caudal fin because these they're not a sort of a reliable way to measure a fish. So, for example, a lot of people will say that um, gold nuggets, so barren citrus, don't get big. They do. And a lot of these estimates that you'll see on websites do actually underestimate a little bit because when people go out in the wild to see these fishes, they see much bigger individuals. Um, and you can get large ones imported. The thing is with importing them is they do tend to, the larger fish, the more they cost because they take up more of that import cost in a way. But, so one of the things that interests me most about Laurel Carrot is their diet. Many people, there's so many myths about diet with Laurel Carrot. Um, for example, many people say they don't eat algae, they're not algivores, they're omnivores. This is totally untrue. The majority of Laurel Carrot are what's known as a detritivore or an algivore. So that's the majority of this group. And there's plenty of studies to back this up. Many feed more on algae and then the, um, or the detritus which is probably like it's very difficult to define what is meant by detritus but bacteria algae um, fungi uh, sort of a mixture of different organisms are likely included in this and that makes up the majority of the group and that's why you see the sort of similar morphology between a lot of them but there is diversity within this some are much more extreme towards the algivore end and others not. And some are happy to be a little bit more generalist, so common plecos are much more generalist. They do not become more carnivorous with age. There's no real studies on how they change with age, um, but their morphology doesn't really change, so it's just going to be the size of the food item more than anything. Um, and also it seasonally only uh, changes more with what's available, like with any fish, I guess. They don't really like say, it's winter, I want this. Um, so they're, they're sort of the big two myths other than wood. So you'll see everywhere that people say plecos uh, need wood for digestion or for their diet. Firstly, the, this is only in reference was only ever thought to be true for the, like, what's it, four genera. So that would be Panax, so the royal plecos, Panaculus, which is a clown pleco, flash pleco, mustard spot pleco. Um, there's another common name, but that sort of group, tiger pleco. 
And then also Hypothemus cotchards on group, so this was its own genus, it's now not. And then last one would be like uh, Lassie and Cistrus, um, Tentacula, um, Heterocanthicus potentially, and then also potentially Pseudoculus um, Coco, which isn't, I don't think it's actually a true ge genus yet, um, but it's kind of like held there. Uh, these fishes are defined by spoon-shaped teeth, and that's because they need to get into the wood. So these are the only fish that are associated with wood, but there there are like ten or so um, scientific studies on this group of fishes, looking at their diet. I would say actually probably more five, but we know they don't digest wood. We don't know that they are. They're only doing this as sort of like they're using the wood to find food within the wood and it makes sense because we find this group outside of environments where there is wood there's so many myths about freshwater habitats but if you look at the wild habitats of some panak particularly there's no wood there so we know they don't digest wood and we know they actually don't use it for digestion the weird thing is, is it's always said they use it for digestion, but this group of fishes are actually feeding on something that's a little bit more easy to digest. But the groups that have no ability to get into words feed on something like insects are much more difficult to digest. Somehow this myth has spread to um, that plecos need wood. It's great behaviour enrichment for that group, but it's spread to all of them. And it's not true. They don't need it. It's beneficial as a hiding place for most. Most do not have those spoon-shaped teeth. And for digestion, it's got no purpose in digestion. Law cards have many other methods of breaking down food further. So I, I guess it's because a lot of brands, after those papers sort of came out, they still were producing these diets or bringing out wood-based diets. And most of them, when you actually look at it, it's just cellulose and cellulose and lignin were the, ingredient, uh, the main compounds that make wood that they can't process and make wood really difficult to process so sadly they are not cyanobores um, other diet things yes there are carnivores and don't just look at um, a lot of people associate the more fancy species with being carnivores this isn't true um, hypencistrus there's um, bangdoracti uh, the um, Microcanthicus might be a little bit more carnivorous, but most of them feed on a lot of algae or le next to no invertebrates. Um, Tenchi seeds, but this is why looking at the diet is so important and actually researching diet because it is so diverse. And unless you're familiar with the different genera and what kind of their niche and what they feed on, don't because um, don't just skip it. Some uh, taxa there isn't much detail on, but it's like these guys, so this is my barren sisters tank, I do have a barren sisters in there, but so it's gold nugget and uh, mango magnums. Um, they feed a lot on algae and they're those very wide jaws. They're specialist algivores. They might look fancy, but no, they are not going to eat meat and it's not good for their digestion. Um, not good in their diet in general. And there's many prepared diets that is a kind of another discussion. But definitely look at the ingredients on the diet because they might say a, a pleco diet, they might say algae pellet, algae wafer, but they might have next to no algae in. Some brands have no algae, uh, one brand labels one diet as algae and it has 5%. And most of it's cereals which aren't digested easy and do potentially have other long-term health issues associated with any fish. Anyway, so other things that you might want to know about plecos, their habitats. They are found throughout Central and South America, um, well, pretty widespread. So there's many different habitats. They tend to inhabit rivers. There are a few that do more lake habitats or the flooded sort of forest, but they do need a good current. They are found where there's somewhat of a reasonable current. This means that it's kind of, they're so diverse that you have to research that individual group. You can kind of, for some genera, make an assumption 
um, especially the smaller ones. The larger ones like Hypostomus and Ancestrus, they then have such a wide range you can't generalise by the genus. You need to look at more their morphology and just research in general. They do need a good current in general. Powerheads for most. Smaller like stuff like uh, the twig catfishes. Um, so that's Farloella, Stosoma, stuff like that. They might not need as much. And then also you've got substrate dwellers, so they're going to need sand. But it's such a wide group, you can't generalise lower cards at all because 1,050 species described. Um, and this is like temperature. Some need sort of unheated, ideal in the UK, sort of house temperature, so 21 or so, 18 to 21, like uh, some ketostoma or some of the really rare ones. But then also there's many that need 28 or above, and that's the more popular, I would say fancy plecos, hypensistra zebra, so that's the zebra pleca LO46, I think, it, it, yeah, 46. Then there's also um, Pseudocanthicus, most of them, uh, the bands, it's just so gold nuggets, um, and then yeah, Pseudocanthicus, Cactus Plecos, a lot of the ones that people want do need those high temperatures. They're slow feeders as well, so that really limits what you're going to put with them. And therefore, also with this range, their parameters actually vary more than people think. There are black water species, there's a lot of white water species, there's ones that deal with a lot of uh, seasonal change in temperature and water parameters. So really research that species, they're diverse. And just because they're plecos doesn't mean they need to be housed together. Um, or do, doesn't mean you should always house just different plecos together. Some are social, some are gregarious. There's a large number of territorial ones and don't assume like juveniles tend not to be as territorial in most of those territorial species but also don't assume or say I'll get females because they're less aggressive that is totally that's just a really old-fashioned sort of myth law cards the females are just as bad if in a way sometimes worse because while the males will stick to their cave um, the females will ro roam around obviously there's um, Plenty of more, much more chilled groups, a lot of carne, so that's whiptail plecos, and some of them, not all. Um, but it just means they're so diverse. And decor as well, caves, all of them will want hiding places, break up their sort of setup with caves and uh, wood and rock and all of that, anything. They don't need plants. If you look at a lot of their wild habitats, they don't actually have that many plants that people think of. Many don't have leaf litter, um, there's obviously numbers that do. It really depends. Don't assume South America and go for black water because many of them are, like large numbers are white water anyway, or clear water. But this video is really just to emphasise the diversity of lower cards because I've seen so many videos where people say uh, generalised plecos so much and you can't do that. They're not a group of fishes that you can get. So many people do this as well. They get one of each in one tank and that's just going to lead to disaster. If you ever look at those tanks where they get one of each, you don't see it in a few years because especially if they're getting more territorial ones, some uh, like Pseudocanthicus, Cactus plecos are very territorial from a small size and they will take on others. Um, if you're getting a large size disparity, so some of mine in here are quite large, um, all of these are quite robust, they will take on smaller fish and that can lead to more issues if you don't have enough caves as well. But also if you think they're widespread, they have different requirements in temperature, um, flow rate to a degree, you can give them usually a good count. Diet is a big one. If you're going to keep carnivores with herbivore, um, herbivores, um, you're going to keep them with algivores, you're going to have to somehow partition that diet so they're not competing and eating on the wrong thing. So definitely do your research with this group of fishes. 
Um, they're not simple and they can live extremely long lifespans. So they're a pet for life in a way. Um, and I think we should encourage not sort of generalizing them as a group. We should encourage filming videos or talking about them individually as in sort of some classification sometimes, but also as species and genera itself. And when it comes to like top fives and stuff like that, there's such a large group you can't just um, like say what's the top five plecos for this aquarium because it depends on the aquarium. They don't do well in busy tanks particularly. They don't compete well. There's other catfish that do better. Um, and also it's comparing such vastly different groups. They, um, their evolution is, um, well they're not, they're quite recently evolved but that many species, it's like saying top five cichlids in general, top five I guess carp like things including goldfish or something but they're such a large group and so I'll end this video here and I'm going to discuss it further I might write an article on it because I think it really needs saying and there's many good channels also that there's so many myths about this group um, that are just being spread and it drives me absolutely mad because I actually care about these fishes um, and I really care about them being kept properly and us improving our welfare with them. Anyway, thank you for watching and goodbye.